because you're really good at what you do, you should be able to get paid for what you do. And then there's One Level Up, which is big mega brokers. I'm pretty lucky to consider myself one of those. It's all possibility. You hope for a great match. You hope for a great battle. I love myself more than ever. Drag is, has totally saved my life. Aaron Kerman knows how to close a deal. He sold over $6 billion worth of real estate during his career, making him the number one real estate agent in Los Angeles. He even sold a single property for $135 million. To see what it takes to be the top realtor in the City of Angels, I spent a day with Aaron, meeting clients and looking at listings in some of the wealthiest pockets of LA. I am at Aaron's beautiful home. I don't even know where I am, somewhere in LA. The first thing you need to know about Aaron is that he is unabashedly selfish when it comes to his morning routine. Aaron can't start the day until he has a Starbucks in his hand. It's like my addiction. He meditates for five minutes by his outdoor pool and then takes a quick dip. When choosing his outfit for the day, he goes for comfort over style. My competition gets stressed to the nines. I'm a t-shirt and jean guy. I'll go list a $100 million house dressed as the way you're about to see me. At 9.45, his morning routine still is not complete. We hop in his Bentley and head to the gym, where he'll squeeze in a 20-minute workout with one of his two personal trainers. Our day officially starts at 11 a.m. with our first meeting, but Aaron has been taking phone calls all morning, from home and the car. Hello. We meet with a property developer who wants to hire Aaron to sell a $15 million home he and his brother built. They'll have a few more walkthroughs before he decides to take on the property. Our next two meetings are with clients whose homes are nearly ready to put on the market. One to be listed for about $20 million and the other one for about $33 million. Aaron does a walkthrough of both to assess the staging and offer feedback. Love, 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 love. I don't, I don't like this table. I hate the chandelier. We gotta get this down. Everything's disgusting. An important part of his job is helping the seller pick a fair price for the property. Aaron can make suggestions, but at the end of the day, it's the seller's decision. This particular home will be listed for just under $20 million, which Aaron approves of. What happens is if a seller price is too high, it sits on the market, and we then have to go to them and ask them for a reduction. In today's market, we don't want that. We want to sell the house for what it's worth and get him on his way. And I'm comfortable with 19 million. Hello? An offer came in uh, a million higher than we were at. Can you also let him know we have a very, very tight schedule? Between meetings, we're in the car, which acts as Aaron's second office. My car time is my work time. Uh, we are on the phone all the time. Uh, it's the only time we can actually really catch up on phone calls. We're running behind all day, but it doesn't phase Aaron. Are you stressed? No, but I do need to make some calls I need because we're late. Our last two meetings are in Bel Air, where big money LA is. Aaron's biggest property sales have come here, including one for $90 million. We spend just 20 minutes at the first Bel Air property. It's still under construction and the seller has a lot of work to do, but the infinity pool isn't in bad shape. Aaron's final appointment of the day is with a potential buyer. He's a billionaire interested in a $65 million mansion. Aaron is meeting with a billionaire right now, which I am not allowed to be in on that meeting. Yeah. Now I can see it. Now, now very it's your exciting. turn. Unfortunately, okay. I felt bad leaving you in the car for that long. <laughs> it's fine. I got to drive Bentley. It's a 28,000 square foot, nine bed, 17 bath masterpiece with a wraparound reflecting pool and home cinema. It even has a hair salon and wellness spa. Interacting with the super rich is part of his day to day. Some of the wealthiest clients happen to be his most frugal ones. Funny enough, sometimes billionaires watch more money than other, like they watch every dollar. We make it back to his office in Beverly Hills by 4.30. He eats a late lunch, steps into a meeting and checks in with his team who helped run his whole life. I wouldn't survive day in and day out if I didn't have somebody doing my emails, my calendar, my marketing, my advertising, my technology. Aaron heads home around 7 p.m., which is earlier than expected. He was supposed to go to a listing party, but it got canceled because of a wildfire in the area. 
There is no typical day in real estate. Um, when we think we have a schedule, it changes 24 seven. Um, it's just at the level that we do, um, people need you when they need you, they want you when they want you, and they wanna see what they wanna see. A big misconception is that all real estate agents earn a ton of money. It's a super competitive industry, and most agents make less than $50,000 a year. A top producer will make between 200 and 500,000 a year. And then you have the very, very, very top, which is a select few that make more than a million. And then there's one level up, which is big mega brokers, and there's not that many in the world, but there are a few. I'm pretty lucky to consider myself one of those. I always tell people, I'm like, look, you drive to work, I fly. There's a, a system in which they build these trips and schedulers that build these trips, and then you're assigned that trip and you're working with that crew for the day. We are completely full with two jump seaters. Hey, how's it going, Melissa? I'm Melissa. Sid. Sid, nice to meet you. Um, just coming in for a briefing. Before we depart, please direct your attention to your video monitors for a brief presentation of safety features. I just go to Comfort Plus, and that shows me all my Comfort Plus passengers. Shows you wheelchair, as you can see. Yeah. There's a wheelchair passenger sitting right there. There's an infant okay. baby. We need to make sure all of our safety equipment is in place. We need to do all of our checks before we can even start boarding. The plane looks good back there. All our pre-flight checks are good. We have to be patient because although we're on flights all the time, there's people who don't know how to operate the overhead bins. There's people who don't know how to put their seatbelt on. We have to remember that on every single flight we're on. This is real life. They're stressing us about closing the door. Bye. Thanks. Have a good day, you guys. Bye. Appreciate it. After a while, you fly so much, you kind of know, like, we know what the single ding means. We know what the double ding means. It's just like any other job or career. You just learn, and you know what those things are. So here's our nemesis soda, Diet Coke. You will watch the fizz. See how much fizz there is? It takes forever to go down. Has that ever happened before? Find anyone? <laughs> we have technology in place that tells us what concourse to go to, what gate to go to next. It tells us how much time before we have to be there. Um, it has all of those things. I love working with my crew. I love showing up to work and having a great crew. And her flying Delta. Deuces. <laughs> When people ask me what I do and I say, I'm a tennis official and I'm a line umpire at the US Open, I always get a look like, what?
Hi, my name is Kevin Ware and I'm a U.S. Open Lion umpire. We're there when the ball lands that close to the line, in or out, and we have to make the call. I will hand out our schedule for the day and I'll relay any pertinent information that people need to know before we go out onto court for our rotation. Any court I go on, you know, it's just, it's all possibilities. You hope for a great match, you hope for a great battle. Each time you go on court, it's new, it's different. You can't think about the last calls you made or the last calls you didn't make that you wish you would have made. It's a very intense, concentration job. The stress sometimes can be a little high. Oh! I've had people say to me, wow, you can see one millimeter. Sometimes, yes, I've won challenges with one millimeter, but I can tell when the ball is touching the line or when it doesn't touch the line. You know, as soon as I leave the court, I pretty much leave the court. How was your break, Kevin? What'd you do? The break was great. I had hummus. <laughs> you For know? lunch? Yeah. During the day, sometimes when you're going to a court and it's warm, you don't want to eat a lot because it can make you sluggish. The biggest misconception is that we go into a court and that we've all been yelled at by John McEnroe. You, you cannot be serious. John retired a long time before I ever hit the court. We see all of the top players from the best place we can see them. Headed back to court, back to meet my crew so that they can see that I'm still here and uh, getting ready to go on and hopefully finish out this match and go on to the next one. When I tell people what my job is, they are always surprised. You're a what? I work at the New York Stock Exchange. You do what exactly? Uh, I'm a trader on the floor. You're a what? Yeah, I'm a trader on the floor. I'm actually the only female trader on the floor. The floor is very fast, especially during the open and the close. It's a lot of moving parts, and it's a lot of just making your voice heard. When I first started, when I would represent myself in the crowd on the floor, often I would be a little mousy. I know that they hired me because I was qualified, so I have to not listen to the self-doubt. Just because you're part of their world doesn't mean you need to be a man. You just need to be yourself, and you need to be strong, confident, and let them know that I'm here and I have a voice and you're gonna listen to me. It's a bit of a men's club. It's always been that way. Why are there no women in this business? It's because men suck. <laughs> Look, we see it in every part of corporate America, and we're seeing it even more now with Me Too and whatnot, that the environment towards women still hasn't changed in so many respects, and it must change. To be a floor broker, you have to get your badge. I got hired and had a month to take the exam. They did not think I was gonna pass, so when I did, it shocked everyone. The men on the floor were like, she's really intelligent. It was all men. Historically, it was all men, except during World War II. There was a period of time during World War II, it was all women. Unfortunately, that didn't carry over. Once World War II was done, the men came back and in the industry, got even more male dominated. There's a famous woman named Muriel Siebert the first woman, only woman in the beginning to ever buy a seat on the stock exchange. She wore a beautiful mink coat when she traded. Well, there was a certain amount of hostility. You know, when you change a tradition that's 175 years old, not everyone's going to love you. I think at the peak, there were probably 70, 80 women brokers. Women came in, they started also at the bottom like everybody did, and they rose up to be brokers and to be actually part of this institution culminating today and Stacey Cunningham becoming the first female president. There are very few women. There are very few women in finance. There are very few women in technology. And we are squarely at the cross sections of finance and technology. So it's a male dominated environment. And you know that, that hasn't changed quite as rapidly as some other industries have changed. I really do believe new changes are coming. 
hopefully with Stacey Cunningham being the new president and you know even my story that will encourage other women to want to come down here as well. Did I know specifically I was going to end up in Wall Street? Like if I were to talk to myself five years ago? Absolutely not. This is amazing and it's surreal and I know that it's a great platform because if I succeed then any woman that comes after me or all the women before me, it just looks great for everyone. And that woman can do this role just as well as a man. As soon as I sit on the subway to go back home, I'm just like, wow, I'm tired. My name is Veronica Pasha. I am 25 years old, and I am a women and children's float nurse and a sexual assault forensic examiner at New York Presbyterian Hospital. I clock in at 7.30. On a day like today, when I'm on labor and delivery, I get here a little early, sometimes like 7, 7.15. I get a set of scrubs, get changed. Then I pick a patient. Then 7.30, we do our change of shift sign out. So the residents, the attendings, anesthesia team, the nurses, we go over every patient that's on the board that morning, go through what part of the labor they're in, what part of the postpartum phase that they're in, if they're recovering, if they're a labor patient that's going to the OR. So like this is like the baby warmer where we'll take babies after they deliver. Then you just start your day, you check your orders, see what's going on with your patient. If they're due for medications in the morning, you do that. We'll go to the bedside and we'll basically just talk about the patient in front of them, go over their age, their history, their allergies. Some shifts you come in and the day is going to be okay and you get a nice break. You could sit down and you know converse with colleagues or like you make, make friends at work. Other days are just so busy you don't have time to sit down for two seconds. You just you pack carrots and grapes, you throw a grape in your mouth and you run back to your patient. My shift starts at 7.30 a.m. and ends at 8 p.m. Sometimes if the unit is short, we'll offer to stay later. So the maximum amount we could work is 16 hours, which would mean the shift ends at 11 p.m. It's 13 shifts a month. It's about three to four shifts per week. There's weekend requirements. You have to do three weekend shifts, so any Saturday, Sunday combination that, that you want. For staff nurses on the floor, seniority is definitely the biggest thing. You get your first pick of vacations and when you want your holidays. When you're new, you just kind of get whatever is left. It is an hourly pay, and then if you stay and you work overtime, then you make time and a half for every year that you work in the position that you're in, you do get a raise. And then if you get a promotion, so for example, just this fall I was promoted from staff nurse to senior staff nurse, you get a bump in your hourly rate also. I went straight from high school to undergrad. I went to Hunter College. So I have my bachelor's of science in nursing. I'm getting my master's right now. It is very expensive. Uh, I wanna say my master's degree costs me about 60,000. So loans are real. <laughs> and that's something that I feel like no one really prepares you for. But nursing is such a great job. There are loan reimbursement programs. Jobs will help you go back to school. So New York Presbyterian has helped me fund a lot of my master's degree. There are so many things that nurses can do that not many people know about. You can go back for law school. You can go into technology. You can go into informatics, public health, public policy. You can go into advanced care nursing to be a nurse practitioner. The opportunities are really endless for this profession. The most rewarding part is definitely patients and creating that rapport with them. And especially in this specialty specific area of labor and delivery, like you're fostering a family, even in unfortunate circumstances when it's a not so positive experience. You know, if we have families that are losing children, it's terrifying, but it's also so rewarding at the same time. The hardest part about my job is being away from my family. The hospital doesn't close on holidays and you have to be here. I FaceTime them and they answer, but it's different when you're physically not there to be with them. The biggest misconception about being a nurse is that you are just giving medications, that you just clean patients, or you're only there for vital signs, which can be really frustrating just because you're such an 
a critical aspect to a patient's care. And then one of the other biggest misconceptions, like specifically for labor and delivery, is that, oh, it's such a happy time and you're around babies all day and that must be super great. And for the most part, it's a great job and that is how my day is. But on other days, I'm running with a mom to the OR because her baby's heart rate is decelerating. I have a box at home, of it's, it's like my, my nursing box, so like if I'm having a bad day, I have letters from patients, copies of sonograms. It's really the best. Sometimes it'll take me a week to make a costume. Sometimes it'll take me three months to make a costume. It really depends. When I first started doing this, I really didn't think it would go anywhere in terms of making money. I thought maybe I'll just be a starving artist. My first gig as a cosplayer was actually being invited as a guest to a convention. They agreed to compensate me for an appearance fee. that I was splitting up my time. I was like taking so many days off of work, so I decided to make the transition. There's so many different ways that I've been able to make money. I stream every weekday. I also have my Patreon where fans will just support me as patrons. I also sell prints online and I sell patterns for cosplay online. When I first started doing it, they were like, okay, when are you gonna stop? Once I turned it into my own career, they accepted it. Here, here's my Farah. The most elaborate costume I've ever made is a character named Farah, and her entire body is bionic. It took me about a year because I kept making mistakes and I kept remaking the whole costume from scratch because I wanted it to just look so good. I sometimes make costumes for other people. Mostly I make it for myself. Cosplay has given me such confidence in myself. Finally, cosplayers and women have something where we can be the ones that, that have the power, have the most notoriety, and it's, it's a really empowering feeling. Oh, Jeff, can I have my phone, my other phone? It's kind of scary to be able to balance, you know, this money that's coming in and plan for my future as well because there's no one telling me what to do. It's a good feeling to feel safe doing art. You're worth money. Don't do anything for free, of course. Because you're really good at what you do, you should be able to get paid for what you do. Laguna has helped David feel beautiful every day. The first time that I put makeup on, I was just like, who is You know, so. Hi there, my name is David Brumfield, but I'm otherwise known as the incredible, gorgeous, talented, beautiful Laguna Blue. Laguna Blue is a mermaid from the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico, so she's super fishy, a little trashy, and she has taken over New York City. She is a live singing drag queen, she's a pop star, she is a comedian, she's a host, she is everything that you've ever wanted in a drag queen ever. She is my best friend, my girlfriend, and I hate her sometimes. Thank you. Hey, everyone, how y'all feeling tonight? I work Tuesday through Thursday, I have Friday off, so then have a uh, then Saturday, Sunday, I'm usually working as well. So on a typical day, I'll probably wake up around 11.30, noon, which sounds glamorous, but it's not because I'm going to bed at 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning. So I'm still getting my six to seven hours. It should be eight. My face wishes that it was eight, but it's six to seven, let's be real. I wake up, I make myself a pot of coffee, and then I, you know, do whatever I have to do. If that's running errands, if that's going to the re uh, rehearsal, uh, going to a voice lesson, going to the gym, 
I need to go to the gym more often. And then I'm usually home by six o'clock to have, you know, cook myself dinner or usually eat Chipotle. So I'm usually starting to get ready around seven, eight o'clock. And then I'm at the venue for uh, 10 or 11. And then I am, I'm like rocking the house down boots, you know what I'm saying? Until about two in the morning and then I'm home around three. I grew up in uh, Prairieville, Louisiana. I was born and raised in the South in the Bible Belt. So I actually had a really hard time being myself. I turned to food as soon as I started realizing that I was different from other people. And so I gained a lot of weight in high school. I was very, very heavy. And when I finally got to college is when I came out to my friends. And as soon as I came out, I lost 60 pounds in like three months. And I remember coming out to my mom and my mom was like, no, you're, you can't be gay. We're gonna pray about it and we're gonna fix it. And I remember literally repeating that to her and I was like, I've been praying for it to go away since I was six, 12. I had a very rough go. I was always picked on. I was just different and I was relentlessly myself and trying to defend that always. When I originally came out to my mom when I was about 20 years old and my mom absolutely did not accept it. And then my mom was diagnosed with cancer a year later, stage four colon cancer. The prognosis was very short. We would, I would just sit by the side of her bed and we would talk, you know. And finally she said to me, I'm so sorry that I tried to make you something that you weren't. The last thing she told me before she left, she said, David, my dream is for all your dreams to come true. She left me in March of 2014. And in September of 2014, I moved to New York City and have never looked back. Oh my God, yes. When I first put on Laguna, oh my God, I looked into that mirror and I was like, oh, it's that woman. Oh. I, I thought I was beautiful. Honestly, it was the first time I like really looked into a miracle. A miracle? <laughs> It's the first time I, it was a miracle. I felt beautiful. I, listen, I have always dealt with like body image issues. Laguna was like this key to, a, to opening a door of like self-love and acceptance. The worst part of drag is putting on body because I'm clearly a man. And so the thing, the thing that makes me shaped like a woman is padding, four or five layers of tights, a layer of fishnets and a corset. My friends make fun of me because my padding is atrocious. This is just like couch cushion foam that has been cut down to look like a hip. And in a tight, it's like pressed against your body. And my friends make fun of me because look, I mean, help me, help me. I need new ones, help, help. Wearing that for upwards of six, seven, eight, you know, I think the longest I've been in drag is like probably 17 or 18 hours. And also like, frankly, I have to make my junk go away. So that being tucked up and out is uh, a little uncomfortable after a while. But yeah, it's just the body. Just being, uh, being in this shape when you look like this. I'm very lucky because I get to do what I love for a living. It gets a little difficult when it's like day 17 in drag, you know, and my skin wants to like rip off of my face and you know, I'm exhausted. But as soon as I'm on stage, it like all goes away. Before I started doing drag, I was an actor. I was also supplementing as a waiter, just like every other actor in New York. And I was also a manny. I was taking care of kids as well, which was fantastic money. What really led me to quit my, my day jobs were my friends Rose and Jan. And they really encouraged me. They said, Laguna, like as soon as you as soon as you make the leap, it's gonna happen. And they were right. Stephanie's Child is New York City's premier live singing drag trio, if not the best in the world. There is no one who can touch what we do. Nobody, especially in drag. We started singing together in 2017 and we have never looked back. That December, we performed on The Voice with Jessie J and that was just like, boom. There's never been a group that does what we do. We sing in three part harmony and we sing very well because a lot of drag queens in New York say they can sing and in fact, they cannot. I would sit in my room and practice all day long. I would sit in my room and just That was kind of when my career really, really just started snowballing into what it is now. It is a huge reason why drag has been so lucrative for me and why I've been able to 
be so successful. I, I love them. I, they are my best friends. Let's go to the show. Doing drag full time has been the most lucrative experience of my life. I've never made more money in my life. I've never spent more money in my life. Truly, all of the money that I make goes right back into it. It just comes with the territory of being a great drag queen, is that you're constantly elevating yourself. To, that means buying new wigs, buying new, you know, new drag, having things custom made for you so you look different than everybody else. I wore this garment on America's Got Talent. Simon Cowell told me I was a horrible vocalist in this. I thought the vocals were terrible. This is a metallic mesh covered in Swarovski uh, crystals. And this went for about, I think, thirteen or $1,400 for this. I, you know, pull four to $5,000 a month, but I'm spending 3,000 of it on drag every single month, whether it be, you know, things are constantly running out. So like, you, I constantly need to buy new foundation, new powder, new nails, new, you know, new wigs. If I have to have a wig restyled, I'll do that. When I first started doing drag, I was living in Brooklyn and I would travel to the Upper West Side for $50 and I was there for four hours and I hated my life. Then I booked my first show and that was 125. So now typically my booking fee for a bar is anywhere between 150 to $300, depending on the night, depending on what I'm doing. And then with tips, ooh, that's for me to know and for you to never find out. <laughs> oh, stop. Don't get me wrong, I love performing for New York audiences. There's something that's really incredible about being in like New York City nightlife, but it is not necessarily something that I can be doing when I'm in 20 years when I'm 50. A hidden expense that a lot of people don't know about for a successful drag queen is like, is a car. I spend anywhere from like, I think the most I've ever spent a month is like $2,000 in travel. When I'm working every single day, it's like $25 there, $25 back, $50 a day just to get to work. It's very rare that the, the venue provides a really great space for you to get ready. So I typically get ready at home. And so because of that, it's a lot easier for me to take a car than to take public transportation, just to be like, not be heckled or not be bothered. Now listen, I'm beautiful, so I don't get heckled that much. But when it happens, it's just like, oh God, get away from me. You know what I'm saying? All these, you know, the dreams that I wanted of success in the arts has become available to me because of drag. And I am able to use every single one of my talents on myself. I am the Barbie doll that I was never allowed to play with. I am totally in charge of everything that I put into the world. And that is the most amazing part for me. My life is, is a million times better than it, what it used to be. I used to be so ashamed of myself. I used to hate myself. And now I love myself more than ever. Drag is, has totally saved my life. Hey everyone, it is Laguna Blue, David Brumfield here, and I'm in my lovely apartment looking out over a quarantine world like a princess that I am. I've been in quarantine since March 12th, and it has been a journey. Let me tell you about it. I went from performing five to six nights a week to not doing that at all. Luckily, I have a talent to fall back on, and uh, that is painting. I have been in my apartment like a Vincent Van Gogh, and I have been painting endlessly. It has been so soothing and so relaxing for me. I have sold about 60 paintings now. I literally have been able to pay my rent and put food on my table because of these paintings. Now, I don't know if I can keep it up for, you know, uh, two, two more months, but, uh, and I will start doing online shows soon, but for now, I'm just sticking to the painting and it's been very, very, I feel so grateful to have it. Thank you for checking in on me. I send you uh, love, light, and lots and lots of health. Mwah.